Welcome everyone to our policing panel, Black and Blue, the persistent problem between the African American community and police gun violence. Um, we have a very distinguished panel here today, and I'm pleased to say. And so the way that we want to structure this program, they're going to give individual presentations, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, because of who we have here today, we're not just going to be talking about the issue that we know exists. We want to also be solution focused. So if you could tailor your questions to that, and if the panelists could be mindful of solutions that they have in mind or things that they might want to see achieved in their opinions, that would be, that would be great. Um, my name is Angela Scott. I am a civil rights attorney with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I am a former prosecutor with the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office and I'm currently the secretary of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section of the American Bar Association. So we really appreciate you being here. Our first panelist is Will Jawando. He is a county councilman in Montgomery County. Um, in addition to that, he's an attorney, activist, community leader with a lifelong dedication to public service. His career has been crafted by unique combination of grit, compassion, and integrity. He was born to a Nigerian father and a white Kansas mother in Silver Spring. Sounds kind of familiar, a little bit. <laughs> um, his, his biracial identity gives him an appreciation for the varied experiences of life in America, that America can bring. Raised in a low-income household, he was determined to secure a successful future for himself through the pathway of education. Will actually attended my law school, CUA, Columbus School of Law. Um, we, however, know each other through serving on a community board together, the Clarence Duburns Association in Baltimore City. Uh, you, Will is a regular commentary for MSNBC and cable news. He's fast becoming a voice of authority on issues surrounding the nation's political climate, public policy, and social justice and he's been featured in an array of national media outlets, including MSNBC, News, New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, MTV, and New York Magazine. He is a devoted husband and father of three beautiful girls and now one boy. So I'm gonna welcome him to the podium and he's gonna talk briefly from his perspective. Okay. Thank you, Angela, and uh, it's just awesome to see you in this world, yes. and thank you for inviting me to be part of this all-star panel. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in addition to Angela said, I uh, civil rights lawyer as well, and I worked uh, in the Obama White House Department of Education uh, and on Capitol Hill for about 10 years through various offices um, before uh, stand at Discovery Communications, but grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I live now, and I represent, uh, I'm an at member of the council where I represent uh, 1.1 million people in Montgomery County, uh, which is our state's largest county, And but I know we have other county folks here, so it's not, not going to say best county. <laughs> so I'll, say state, I'll stick to the facts. <laughs> um, and uh, it's great to be here today. The topic is obviously, um, and <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I have one of these in front of me a lot, so there you go. Uh, the topic's obviously an important one. Uh, we're in a new era uh, of policing uh, and criminal justice in our, in our country. Um, uh, I know you all know that. And, you know, I want to frame the conversation, and I'll get to some, some of the things I've been working on and how I think can be solutions oriented. But I think we have to ask ourselves, in, in these serious cases, um, we invest in our police and our law enforcement a, a, a significant power, right? It's the power to uh, deprave, deprive people of liberty. It's the power to use force. It's the power to, in some circumstances, uh, take life. Uh, and we do it all 
for a very simple reason. We do it because we want them to keep us safe as a community and we want to be able to operate and have a good quality of life. And we, they, so they're there to protect and serve. And I think it's important to start there when you have these discussions because the power that is vested in the police comes from the people, just like the power in, or like the officials or anyone else. Uh, and so when we approach this conversation, I think we need to approach it from a vantage of we've given the power, so it's appropriate, uh, it's certainly where we are today, to talk about are, is that power being exercised in the way it should be? Uh, and are there limits to that power? And what should they be? Uh, and, and when should they apply? And, and I think often we get in this conversation that we skip that part. Uh, Brian Stevenson, who you all know, talks about um, do we deserve as a society to kill people? And he normally is talking about it in the context of the death penalty. I think there's a strong argument that when one in nine people uh, who are killed, uh, one in nine death penalty sentences, rather, are exonerated, uh, that's not a really good track record. You know, I know we're not here to talk about death penalty, but I think you can apply this to the police killing situation. If you got on a plane, they say one in nine of you aren't going to make it. Uh, that's not a good odds. And, and I think, so that question of when can life be taken by the state and when is it justified is a serious question. Um, we obviously have serious issues with criminal justice overall, right? That we know that one in three black males, give or take on the year, uh, are either in jail or prison or under some probation or parole. Um, in cities like Baltimore and uh, New York and other places, that can be over 55% of the population, black males between 18 and 30 that are either in prison, in jail, or under probation or parole. And so we, we know that interactions that African Americans and people of color have with police more often than not have the ability to end in a negative outcome for that resident. Uh, and I say negative outcome because it could range from having, uh, getting a ticket or a fine that you're not able to pay, uh, to being arrested or incarcerated, to obviously, in the case that we're talking about today, having your life taken, right? And so these are serious outcomes, and we know disproportionately that it happens for people of color in that way. And so I'm telling you things I know you already know, but I just think it's important to frame uh, why this is such an important uh, discussion, and that how we have to embrace, embrace and kind of gird it in that every human life has dignity, uh, and that when it is taken and how it's taken, and the circumstances surrounding and surrounding that need to be analyzed and have a high level of scrutiny uh, because that's the ultimate, you know, life will be pursuit of happiness. Life is the ultimate of what we hold in our society uh, as, as one of your kind of God-given rights and your basic rights. Um, and so I'm, I'm just coming today, uh, it's actually, I'm going to break a little news here at the ABA panel. Um, I, I introduced to my first bill, uh, called the Law Enforcement Trust and Transparency Act uh, on Martin Luther King's birthday, January 15th, uh, that would require uh, independent police investigations uh, and public reporting of the investigative report in the case of police involved death. Um, and uh, that bill uh, was introduced, it was co-sponsored by all eight of my colleagues, we have nine member county council, uh, it has gone through two work sessions in the Public Safety Committee, the one of which I just came from. Uh, and was just passed out of the Public Safety Committee this morning, about an hour and a half ago. Um, and so we'll head to the full council for a vote probably May 7th. And so it's exciting for me and then that it's my first bill, but it's also, uh, uh, I think, a, an example of the type of progress I wanted to talk about briefly here. I'm just telling you my have like two minutes or something going on. I, I won't go too long. Um, this, one of the things that prompted me to introduce this bill, other than having living, uh, you know, 35 plus years in, as a black man in, in America, was the uh, shooting of an unarmed man in uh, Silver Spring, where I live, Robert White, uh, about 10 months ago. Uh, he was walking in his neighborhood, uh, a walk that he did every day, uh, and was noticed uh, by a police officer who was clearing a 911 hang-up call. So he wasn't there in the area responding to anything. Was someone called 911, hung up. He had cleared, checked it out, nothing happened. He was heading back to his car and was getting ready to pull off. And, and we know, all we know based on his testimony through his lawyer was that he observed Mr. White uh, having a ripped jacket, staring at the police officer, and putting his hand in his pocket. 
And based on those three things, uh, he made the decision to pursue saying that he looked suspicious. And, and mind you, all three of those things I've done many, many times in my life um, uh, when interacting or about to interact with a police officer. Ripped clothing is popular. <laughs> um, it's a fashion statement now. And so, uh, so he followed this gentleman. Uh, his body camera came on several minutes later, and we, it ended in an interaction that when Mr. White, who had mental health issues and was known to the community, uh, after telling the police officer to leave him alone, stop following him for about uh, several minutes, you know, more than six, seven minutes, charged the officer, and the officer ended up shooting at him seven times and killing him. And uh, our community has been sh shaken by this. Uh, in that many people knew who he was. He, again, he was on his walk that he did his daily constitutional every day, the same path as on the great day. And they were wondering why a black man, 41 years old, uh, can't walk in his neighborhood without the fear of losing his life. And one of the things I, I argued, we uh, had an investigation by the police into, the, into this bill, into the killing, and they deemed that it was lawful and justified. Uh, you'll hear from Mr. Gibson later, who his pre predecessor had an informal arrangement with our state's attorney to review investigations of police involved death and determine whether there was any criminal liability. That also came back in the form of a two sentence letter from Howard County saying that the killing and the shooting was justified without any further explanation. And so we had uh, some significant uproar from the community and Part of what led to my bill, where we're now saying that our police should not be investigating uh, deaths of individuals that they kill. Um, and that's a best practice from President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force that suggests that both the, the police investigation and the prosecution uh, and separate recommendations be independently done so that we can try to build and maintain community trust. Um, and so I'm happy that it's moving forward, but it's only a small piece of what we need to do in these situations. You know, obviously I mentioned to you, I actually told you to draw my story. Why was he stopped? Uh, why do we, I've said this many times, if you can have this type of situation, if the same facts happened again, and another person was walking with a rip jacket, who put his hand in his pocket, and who stared at the police officer, and that can initiate a stop that could lead to the eventual death of the resident, I think that's the wrong policy. And, and we need to look at the incentive structure around why are we policing the way we police. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on now is uh, another piece of legislation that is honoring the remembrance and reconciliation of three African American men who were lynched in Montgomery County. Uh, I work in a building, the county council office, that used to be the county jail. And two of them were dragged out from the jail in the late 1800s and literally hung right in front of the building. And uh, we have to recognize that the history of policing and law enforcement with our community is not too distant history. It's very charged, <laughs> and I think the need for transparency uh, and independence is paramount. But also the need, this is where I'll end, uh, for community policing. Uh, and not just saying the word, you throw it around a lot. One of the things I've said over and over again, if you remember about Mr. White, he was on a walk that he did every day. But this officer whose beat was, he was on his beat, he wasn't, off, he wasn't an officer from another beat, didn't know who he was. If you're saying you're doing community policing, and you have someone who's walking a walk that they walk every day, and you don't know who he is, you're not doing your job. In many of our police stations, you have these boards, and I'm, I've, I've, seen, I've seen them, I've seen printouts of it, of the cops that get the praise, the police officers that get the praise are the ones who have the most arrests, the most stops, the most tickets, uh, the most uh, any, any type of infractions. They're not being praised for how many community meetings did you attend, how many situations did you de-escalate, uh, what were your uh, conversations uh, with this segment of the community. And so I think we need to also talk about changing the incentive structure of how we define success in policing. Because we need to limit, in addition to all the implicit bias, training, and all those things, we need to fundamentally reorient how we approach policing. Uh, and so we're going to be doing some follow-up legislation uh, that will create a police uh, policy advisory committee, citizens advisory committee, 
Sacramento recently set one of these up where it has police and community members that look at a whole range of issues uh, and look at data in a critical way. It's staffed, like unlike police, sometimes these advisory committees are just set up and they have no staff and no resources. You have to give them resources. And it's going to look at why, I'm stopping, why 55%, and I'll leave you with this number, 55% are police just uh, released their use of force statistics. 55% of the people arrested in 2018 were black in Montgomery County. Now, if you're not from Montgomery County, we make up about 18% of the population. So 55% of the people arrested in 2018 were black. If you add Latinos into there, you get over 73% of the people arrested in 2018 in Montgomery County were black or Latino. You can, you can look at the same, same thing with stops, same thing uh, with uh, as, as I mentioned, the rest. So, so we have a systemic problem in how we police, and I think those are the next steps. Let's get transparency and accountability when, and out, when a situation happens, but if we're really going to roll this back, we're going to need to look into the data of how we police so that we can limit those interactions, and then when an interaction does happen, how is it happening from a viewpoint that limits the amount of bias, and that's continuing the training that's going to be required. So with that, I'll pause and look forward to the questions. And you actually raised um, something that is of tremendous concern to me because I have a younger brother who is African American and autistic, and he has a walk routine, as many of you know about people with autism. And so it is very important that police within the community get to know certain individuals. Um, I'm going to introduce our next panelist, uh, Rich Gibson. Mr. Gibson graduated from Howard University School of Law in 2003. He's been a prosecutor for 15 years in multiple jurisdictions throughout the state of Maryland, and he's handled virtually every kind of criminal case one can handle, including homicides, police-involved shootings, gang prosecutions, human trafficking, large drug trade organizations, and sex offenses. Rich is a 2006 Maryland State Bar Association Leadership Academy Fellow, which is how we met. <laughs> and he's a past president of the Waring Mitchell Law Society, which is the Minority Bar Association for Howard County. Um, in 2016, Rich was recognized as Prosecutor of the Year for the Mid-Atlantic Region by the Mid-Atlantic Regional Gang Investigators Network. And in October of 2018, he received the Criminal Justice Reform Award by the Maryland Emerging Leaders Pop. Um, and most importantly, in November of 2018, Rich was elected to be Howard County State's Attorney, and he is the first African American to hold this position. So that's a tremendous accomplishment. He is married and has three wonderful children. So you welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I just teased Will saying he beat me by one because he's got one more kid than I do, and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more time. We're done. Um, so my honor to be here today. Uh, I, I want to share with you some anecdotes of my experiences. Um, as Angela said, I, I prosecuted for 15 years, and much of that time was just in Baltimore. I started off in Prince George's County under Glen Ivy. Um, and I did uh, drug court and juvenile drug court and district court and circuit court there. And in 06, um, a colleague of mine uh, said, if you really want to be good at prosecution, you've got to go to Baltimore. Because that's where the problems are. That's where the systemic issues are. That's where the challenges are. And um, if you really want to be good, go to a place where it's most difficult to do it and then try to succeed in that environment. So you can thrive there, you can thrive in many environments. Um, and me being glutton for punishment, I decided, you know what, sounds great, about to have my first child, and I'm going to take this on. And I uh, came to Baltimore and had my eyes open. Um, Prince George's County has its challenges, but Baltimore City um, has systemic ingrained issues in that the, the part of it stems from the community. The community has an ingrained distrust for police, an ingrained distrust for law enforcement. And so getting cooperation and dealing with certain issues is very, very challenging. Getting witnesses to um, come forward is very, very challenging. And I want to be clear, the community's view of law enforcement is justified. 
There is a, re a reason for that distrust, and it is based on systemic issues related to the way law enforcement communities interact with communities of color. Um, it, it relates to poverty. There's a whole bunch of systemic issues that are driving this underlying feeling which impacts justice and the way justice is administered. Um, I guess the analogy I would use, actually, it was from a book that I think really captured it. Um, you, can, you can look at law enforcement, in particular police, uh, much like a, a the, the analogy is a, is a computer. So for some people, they view police as the operating system. They're in the background, making sure things move smoothly and transition from point A to point B really, really well. For other people, an equally valid view of law enforcement is that of the pop or the virus that's popping up out of nowhere. It's scary. It's interfering with your ability to do things you want to do. It's seen as something that is intrusive and um, you know negative. And both points of view have validity. Uh, I think that that is part of the issue that you deal with when you talk about the community and the community interrelates with law enforcement. I think a, a large part of that has to do with a system that does have, you have to acknowledge the elephant in the room, it has a systemic bias that is in place. That bias is in part based upon overt things, and it's part based upon implicit bias. It, the, the biases that we all have in our core that impact the judgments we make in everyday interactions. Um, I think that in the, in the law enforcement context, that systemic bias really has the opportunity to play out in negative ways. And, and in the most severe case, um, as Councilman Gelando uh, indicated, it can, it, it can lead to the loss of life. I think that in order to counter systemic bias, you need to have several things. But you need to have an empathetic and open-minded policing force and empathetic and open-minded prosecutors. The, the reality is that the state's attorneys, the prosecutors, have the ability, if they're operating properly, to overview and review all of the action of law enforcement. We get to review their conduct. Part of our mission statement isn't just to prosecute crimes, but to ensure that police, when they interact with the community, do so in ways that are, that are lawful, do so in ways that are consistent with the Constitution. And, and that is a core function of the prosecutor. Um, and it is important to note that in our nation, most of the prosecutors are white. And that plays into, uh, has an impact on outcomes because of, again, a lack of, potential lack of empathy. Um, by way of analogy, I'll, I'll tell a case. This wasn't my case, but it does demonstrate um, the issue. A colleague of mine had a case where a med student, a real white med student, was, uh, he lived in a house that had a detached garage. And the garage had been, had been built into over and over and over again. And he was frustrated. He called the police numerous times. Nothing was happening. They weren't getting, they weren't solving the problem. This med student decided that on one night he heard noises in the back of someone messing with his shed, his detached garage. And the reason why I say it's detached is because it's legally significant. As a, as a, it has a legal um, importance. So the, the, the garage was detached, he heard noises, he called the police, um, and he decided I'm going to go handle this myself. He went to um, the wall, and on his wall he had an ornamental samurai sword. He unsheathed the sword, walked out his back door, down the steps, um, there's hedges that aligned the shed, walked past the hedges to the shed, found the shed door, or garage door, open. Looked inside, saw that things had been messed with been ransacked, and he was upset. Didn't see anyone there, he closed the shed door, locked it back up, and began walking back towards his steps. As he did so, he heard a rustling in the hedges that aligned the garage. He turned and he raised the sword like a bat, uh, two hands, and said, come out! And the individual, who happened to be a black male, was in the hedges, came out, and he came out with his hands up. Whether out of fear or frustration, the med student uh, swung the samurai sword, cleaving through his fingers into his clavicle into the middle of his chest. Guy split and died. Um, police arrived on scene because they were called, um, and they found the scene. The med student um, gave his his uh, admission that he did this and was taken down to homicide to be interviewed. Prosecutor, who was a colleague of mine, went and interviewed. 
the, the med student, uh, this prosecutor, who's a colleague of mine, um, is a white man, he's an older gentleman. I know him extremely well. There's not an overtly racist bone in this person's body. He interviews the med student, and um, at the conclusion of that, he declines to prosecute the case. And the med student was apologetic and sorry. It was our habit at that time um, to gather in the evenings after work and have a drink in the office and talk and kind of be impressed. And so I went to uh, his office. No problem. I went to his office and um, got a glass and we began to talk. And I asked my colleague, you know, why did you make the choice that you made? And his response to me was, Rich, this kid, he's in med school, he's going to go on, he's going to save lives. Uh, he's incredibly apologetic. You'll never do this again. Um, you know, he, he's, he's not somebody who, who, um, who is going to be a problem in the a, in a future. He's, he's terribly sorry. And my response to my colleague was, look, um, and we had the ability to be candid with each other, which is, again, part of the reason why I'm telling the story. Uh, I said to my colleague, look, what you showed at this individual was mercy. All right, you could have charged him. There were charges that were appropriate to bring. You deemed it unnecessary and chose not to do so. And that is a fair choice. But what I want you to understand is the corollary to that is that there are many defendants who don't necessarily remind you of your son or your grandson or yourself because you saw a piece of yourself in this individual which allowed you to extend that mercy. And when people don't have that that commonality, maybe you don't get the same benefit of the doubt. And that creates imbalances, not out of any malicious sense, but out of a sense of a lack of empathy and a lack of ability to, to associate yourself with someone that's similar to you. Which is why I do believe it's very critical that we have diverse voices in the room. So we can have those kind of conversations so that people in the future, to that case is done and settled, can be uh, reflective and contemplative of the, the various things that impact the decision in the case, and whether mercy is warranted or not, and whether you're being equal or egalitarian in the way that you view these cases, or are you only viewing people that seem like they look like you and giving them and saying that benefit. And so having diversity in that space is critical. And, and, and that matters for the police, and that matters for prosecutors. Right? And again, we are the entity that regulates and oversees the police, and so that is a core function of our, of our job. Um, I want to add that, you know, similar to what Mr. Juano said, I'm, I'm 43, uh, or 43 next week, and, you know, I've lived a life as a black man in this society. I've been pulled over at gunpoint for no reason at all, right? So I've experienced that. Um, I do understand that there are biases that are in play. I do understand that policing out of fear is what leads to a lot of problems we have. And I think that what we, what we need to do is ensure that the enemies that are reviewing and looking at these instances are doing so with an eye towards justice, with an eye towards holding people accountable. It is an awesome responsibility to be a police officer. It's an awesome responsibility to be a prosecutor. And when we have that responsibility, we have, that, we have an obligation that's commensurate with that responsibility to evaluate cases in a light that produces positive results for our community. Um, Mr. Juwondo commented on uh, my predecessor. My predecessor um, had an agreement with Montgomery County that, um, that was an oral agreement. I didn't know that until I took office. But it was an oral agreement that the fiscal strategies and solutions piece that you have to talk about, Angela. Um, an oral agreement with Montgomery County that in cases where there was uh, a death caused by an officer, that um, the, the sister jurisdiction would evaluate, as the prosecutor's office, evaluate the conduct of those officers and determine whether or not charges are appropriate. And if they are appropriate, would we'll bring those charges. And that was designed and put in place orally between my predecessor and um, uh, Mr. McCarthy, who is his attorney for Montgomery County. Upon getting into office, Oh, and upon learning the agreement was oral, um, I thought that that did not offer 
the protections that I believe the community warranted, nor that the office should have when making these kind of decisions. And so I sat down and met with Mr. McCarthy um, and let him know, one, I agree with the underlying philosophy of the agreement, that it is good to have a separate um, overseeing agency, over a prosecutorial agency evaluating these cases, primarily because police and prosecutors work very, very closely with each other. And um, at, just as a surgeon would not want to perform surgery or should not perform surgery on their family member because proximity can be blinding to certain negative things um, or positive things. It can be incredible bias one way or the other. Uh, you, would, you would equally not want to have a prosecution's office when they work very closely with police overseeing that police conduct. You'd rather have a separate agency that has some distance that can be dispassionate and objective in reviewing what is actually occurring and decide based on the facts and the law, what happened here, and what outcome is, is merited. Um, and I, while agreeing that we should continue to, to have this MOU between us, felt that it should be in writing and should require a written document that lays out the, the facts examined, the uh, law that was analyzed, and the conclusion that was reached. So it's not simply you know, a one, two sentence letter when someone is, is not, the outcome can be exactly the same. You might decide not to prosecute, you might decide to prosecute. But either way, there should be a robust explanation that is provided to the, the, the neighboring jurisdiction so that they can then take that information and relay not the, the memo itself, but the, the process that was undergone in reaching the conclusion. Um, so that's, my, that's, that's the solution that I, that I am um, bringing to the table to address this issue. Um, a single, it doesn't happen that frequently in Howard County or Montgomery County, fortunately, um, but a single death is a death too much. We have to guard against that because what's at stake is people's faith in justice in our system. And we have to always act in ways to preserve that. Thank you and I look forward to your question. Thank you. So I want to introduce our next panelist, Jose Fangel. He is an assistant district attorney at the New York County Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where he currently serves as the chief of staff to the investigations division. In this role, he assists in managing six bureaus and setting policies to be followed by ADAs within the investigation division. Most recently, he was assigned to the Major Economic Crimes Bureau, where he investigated a wide array of white collar crimes, security fraud, and numerous international financial institutions. Since joining the New York County District Attorney's Office in 2008, he has tried a variety of felony cases, ranging from street level narcotics, auto thefts, complicated white collar embezzlements, and securities fraud. He earned his JD from the Pennsylvania State University Dickinson School of Law and received his BA from Loyola University in New should I say, what can I say? Uh, and that's difficult because, as our panelists have said, I live in this body every day. I have children who live in care bodies, and this issue is personal to me. Um, I am driving back to New York after this. I got here without incident. I would like to see my son tonight, hopefully without incident. So this issue, even as a prosecutor, is one where my experience and the experience of others here is different from our colleagues. Uh, some of us wear suits to work and you deal with police officers every day and there's a certain level of respect and camaraderie amongst the people that you work with. But this is not what I dress like on the weekend. This is not what I will be driving in when I go home. And this is not what I wear when I go hang out. So what happens? The level of respect, camaraderie, and the relationship between people that look like us and the police sometimes changes. And not for the best. 
And that's the issue that I think we have as a society and one that we're trying to deal with. Um, New York County, just Manhattan, which is where I work, none of the other counties, uh, which include the Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens, has about 1.7 million people who live in New York County. We have millions more that come and visit every year. Uh, what that means is that there's a lot of crime that happens. And even though we're one of the safest big cities in the country, it's still a place where our office has to pro process a lot of arrests. Um, back in 2009, we used to process about 110,000 misdemeanors and felonies a year. We are down 48% to about 55,000 a year. That's still a lot of cases. 30% um, of the people who get processed in Manhattan receive what's called desk appearance ticket, which means they don't actually go into jail and don't get fingerprinted on the day that they are formally arrested, but instead come back at a later date when they are processed and charged by a criminal complaint. Nevertheless, the majority of cases that we handle deal with either drugs, assault, or um, and theft. That's kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the office and the trial division. The reason that we are down 48% is because of the policies that District Attorney Vance Jr. has put into place since he came in. And you don't get to that number easily. It does not come without media protestation, police being upset, people in the community being upset. It, it takes a lot of leadership to in fact decide that you're going to use your discretion as a prosecutor and not prosecute certain crimes. So what don't we prosecute in our office based on our discretion? We no longer prosecute somewhere fair evasion. Jumping the turnstile in New York is a misdemeanor, punishable by 365 days in jail. Okay. We no longer prosecute keeping your feet up on the subway or taking up two seats, which is also a misdemeanor in New York. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we also no longer arrest, well, we no longer process and prosecute personal possession of marijuana in someone's pocket. Uh, we also don't, if anyone's ever been to Harlem and you've ever walked down the street and you've seen the vendors, technically everyone out there is unlicensed general vending, also a misdemeanor in Manhattan. Uh, we also no longer prosecute people that drive for suspended license if that license is suspended for failure to pay some other court administrative fee or for some reason the suspension relates to the inability to pay some sort of money. Uh, based on those decisions that we've instituted office wide, our numbers are drastically decreasing. That's not to say that we don't have problems. Uh, when I was a young assistant, I used to go to arraignments in a late night shift. And the one thing that stuck out in my mind every time I was there was that the overwhelming majority of the people who were being processed that I was arraigning looked like me. They could very easily show up at my next day on the barbecue and nobody would know the difference. And this effect that that has on your psyche as a prosecutor of color, when you look at every person that's coming through the room and being shuffled through as a docket number is serious. It's something that prosecutors of color discuss with each other. It's something that we need to address in order to make sure that we can retain people because every day, if your job is to prosecute people from your community, and that appears to be the only community that's committing crime, it has an effect on us psychologically. And that's something that we have to deal with every day. Now, the stats are, and I don't, I have them, but I don't need them because as I said, I've been in court. 80% uh, of the people who we prosecute are either black or Latino in New York. Uh, that's the reality of what it is. And how we got to those numbers, I'll tell you shortly. But uh, part of that means that 53% of our arrests come from Harlem, Washington Heights, or Inwood, which is all of Upper uh, Manhattan. 10% come from the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side. It's both sides of Manhattan together. And then about another 25% comes from the Midtown area, which is more a reflection of all the stores and the shopping that happens there, as opposed to the actual population, which is not many people are concentrated in that area. So what are the solutions and how do we get these numbers down? Part of it is the creation of the pre-arraignment diversion program which the office has put into place, where instead of having people's cases initiated and go through the entire system, we now divert them either for drug treatment or mental health treatment. Um, the second aspect is working with the NYPD to reduce the arrest for the numbers of marijuana, which disproportionately which disproportionately affects people of color. Uh, also, declining to prosecute certain nonviolent misdemeanors uh, with a public safety exception based on the person's prior criminal record, as well as a clean slate program where we wipe out old warrants on a specific day. If you come in, you have an old warrant, the 
a failure to pay, a failure to appear in court, we will wipe it and we'll start the slate and the case brand new again so that the person doesn't have to live in fear of having an outstanding warrant, as well as our alternatives to incarceration. Now, all of that is what my office, I think, is doing, and it's great that we're doing it, but I still have to live out in the real world. So how does this affect me? I'm not entirely sure. Do I appreciate the numbers and the look that we're giving at prosecution? Yes. However, I still have to walk around certain neighborhoods and be in certain areas. Uh, less than a year ago, I moved to a new neighborhood in Westchester, New York, and I was down in D.C. for the day at a very large meeting that involved partners from Pick a Firm, uh, top 20 of them from New York, and I was one of the two people leading the, uh, the meeting for that day. Pretty much the highlight of my career up to that point. I was prepared, I was on point, I knew what I was saying, and I knew that the facts were on my side. Ultimately, the case was resolved, um, and it went the way that I expected that it would. But later that night, I had to go home. And I just moved to the neighborhood and got off the train and didn't realize that the bus stopped running at 8.05 and I got home too late. So I decided to walk home. I didn't realize at the time that I lived about 1.6 miles from where I was walking to because it was a five-minute bus ride, but I found out that night, the very long day in the middle of the summer. Uh, yeah, I definitely got my steps in that day, but I took off my tie because it was so hot and I was sweating and I took off my tie. And about three blocks from my house, I got stopped by the police. And the first thought in my mind, because this replayed over and over, was, why did you take off the tie? As if that was somehow going to make a difference to whether or not I was going to be stopped. At which point the officer didn't give me the courtesy of getting out of the car, he had his lights on me, and he proceeded to yell at me that someone was breaking into homes. And then I really thought to myself, well, if I had had the tie on, that clearly would have been evidence that I was not breaking into people's homes, because who would wear this outfit for a breaking and entering? Um, the officer asked me where I lived, and didn't tell him, because I just moved in. I mean, it was going to be pretty obvious to figure out that I was the only person in the neighborhood, or one of the few people in the neighborhood, but I just didn't want to tell him. So I kept my hands up, and that was my interaction for that night. I went from having the highlight of my career to having the low point of that year within a 12-hour span and about 300 miles. And that is what I have to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, my son, just two days ago, interestingly enough, we were talking about whatever he was learning in daycare, and he told me, police make the rules. That was his statement. And I thought to myself, my wife and I, we're both lawyers. We talked to him as, a, as an adult. His vocabulary is very uh, extensive for a child of about four years. And I thought to myself, should I tell him the truth? That the legislature in Albany makes the rules, prosecutors help the police enforce it, and kind of give him the rundown of how the system works. Then I realized that he's a boy of color. And for now, until I can have better conversation with him, it's best for him to understand that on the street, when I need him to get home, at that moment, the police do make the rules. So this is an issue that's important to me because not only does it affect my life, but it affects my children's life. And I have another boy on the way, um, and that is yet another issue that I have to deal with. I now have to have the conversation twice. So while I think that prosecutors do a great job, and I think we have some reform-minded prosecutors that are out there, there are still issues that need to be addressed. And you have two individuals here who have been elected to office, I think in part probably, and I don't know them, but for the change that they're trying to bring to their communities. But that's going to require more than their efforts and more from the police department and the local community to work with newly elected prosecutors or reform minded prosecutors to try and achieve those changes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our next panelist, Devon Love. He's the Director of Public Policies for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. For over a decade, he has sharpened his oratory and political analysis skills. As a Forest Park High School student, he discovered the world of policy debate after slipping into a practice session for the Baltimore Urban Debate League team to keep warm before school one day. Devon was so skilled at policy deb debate as a high school student, it earned him a scholarship to Towson University. He then gained national attention when he and fellow debaters won the Cross-Examination Debate Association National Championship. He co-founded Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, giving vision to the mission, signature programming, and infrastructure for the black institution. 
Like other members of legal leaders of the beautiful struggle, Devon believes that all groups and campaigns that endeavor to fix policies that harm predominantly African American communities must be led by African Americans. In Baltimore, that covers a a lot of issues including affordable housing, economic development, education, and criminal justice reform. Um, welcome to the podium. All right, <laughs> excuse me, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So as I mentioned, my name is Dave Love, Director of Public Policy and Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, where a grassroots state tank um, that was founded in 2010. We've taken up uh, various different um, efforts at addressing issues that most directly impact people of African descent, people of color more broadly. Um, we focus primarily on Baltimore City and the state of Maryland, so we worked on things like police reform, which I'll talk more in detail about, pre-trial reform. Um, we've looked at um, the way in which uh, organizations, uh, black leg races organizations, they will get access to dollars to do the preventative work that will keep many of, of our young people um, outside of the uh, prison system. What I want to do first is kind of set the stage for what I'll put forward as the solutions that are important um, in looking at the issue of police reform. It's really important that we understand that we live in a society structured on racism and white supremacy, and that's a sociological fact. Every index of quality of life demonstrates that people of African descent, and again, people of color more broadly, um, are that, that we live in a society that undermines our very humanity, right? And that many of the indicators of quality of life are at or near the bottom. That's important because I find that we live in a society where there is a lack of what we call race literacy. Racism is so endemic in our society, it's baked into every aspect of civil society. And unfortunately, many of us are socialized in a society that make issues of race and white supremacy. When I say white supremacy, I'm not talking about like individual people being bad people or bigoted or mean. And unfortunately, you know, we live in a society where that's the way that people have come to understand the term. When we talk about white supremacy, we're talking about a system, and we talk about a collective consciousness that organizes the way that people interact with the systems that exist in our society, and that organize the way in which people uh, who run those institutions operate, operationalize those institutions. And so it's really important that, as we understand, again, this term race literacy, um, I, I like to use the term race literacy um, similar to the way that people would think about a math problem. That if you don't understand the operations in the math problem, you have no way of accurately understanding what's actually going on. And unfortunately, we live in a society, again, where the tools that are necessary, the analytical tools to understand the way that racism and white supremacy operates, um, are not widely available. There's an element to conversations about police reform that I think is important and that oftentimes doesn't get had in mainstream spaces. So there's the conversation about the obvious brutality and the kind of obvious um, attack on our quality of life as people of African descent that we face as a result of the police system in the society. There's also an element, though, where there's the way in which black suffering has become a spectacle in mainstream society, that images and representations of black pathology are things that are highly circulated and made most available to us, and that conversations about police brutality in the public mainstream, in many cases, make a spectacle of the death of people of African descent, and when we talk about police violence, in ways that actually further create or perpetuate this pathologization um, or pathologizing of black people. And what I mean by that is this. So we're in Maryland. Um, our former mayor and then governor, Martin O'Malley, was responsible while he was mayor for a mass arrest policy. It was an independent um, human rights organization um, where there were 700, 757,000 illegal arrests between 1999 and 2006. In fact, in 2005 alone, there were 100,000 illegal arrests. The ACLU of Maryland, the, the Baltimore branch of the NAACP, and then Delegate Joe Carter um, actually sued the city for illegal arrests for the year 2005 and won. And so as we see the uprising that happened in 2015, there are policies that led to the culmination of what happened in 2015. And that, and that it's important for us to understand that if we look at that mass arrest policy, 
That mass arrest policy is the outcome not just of Martin O'Malley himself as an elected official, but it's also the demonstrative of the lack of regard for the humanity of poor and working class black people. And that that is ubiquitous. That we're in a moment now where it's sexy to be reform minded. So mandatory minimums, there was a moment where mandatory minimums was the politically expedient thing to do because of the high rates of crime, violence, and homicide. And so this society was literally willing to throw away the lives of poor working class black people in order to appease a political system which had internalized racist caricatures of black people that rendered black folks in communities plagued by violence as inherently violent, right? Um, as, inherent, as inherently violent, as inherently um, prone to criminality. Instead of understanding the fact that we live in a society against structural racism and white supremacy, which means that people are going to be faced with challenges, black folks are going to be faced with challenges, but if you don't address those challenges, then it would make sense that you see the kind of crime and violence that we see in a place like Baltimore City. Amos Wilson, in his book on black violence, he describes the phenomena of homicide in, in places like Baltimore City as the externalization of a suicidal impulse. That when you live in a society where the constant images that you're fed, you're inherently criminal, you know, you're inherently inferior, both intellectually and otherwise, that people in the community internalize that. And then the policies that I just, the example of the policy I mentioned is Joe Thomas' policy of Arnold Malley, the policies of this society then reinforce that notion of the worthlessness of the lives of black folks. And so I would argue to you that when we talk about policing, and the, and the phenomena of police violence against black people, we're not talking just about bias. We're not talking just about individual bad interactions with police officers. You're talking about an industry, like any other industry, that has internalized the collective consciousness that operates in all institutions. And when you look across all major industries in the society, again, the humanity of people of African descent is undermined. And so there's an inherent lack of value attributed to the lives of black folks, particularly poor and working class black people. And so the interactions that folks have with police officers has more to do with the, with the reality, with the political reality, that there are no consequences for violating the human rights of poor and working class black people, right? There's a consequence, there's a consequence maybe for violating the, the human rights of a black person that may be ingratiated into the you know, system, the, the institutions of society that seem is respectable, right? Those of us that are college educated, right? Those of us that run organizations. Um, and certainly, white folks, right, have the protection of a society that values their lives so enough that their lives are going to be valued. That if, a, if an officer does something that undermines to, viol to, to violate their rights, that there will be a level of care and attention put to that that again is not given to folks of African descent. So I'll end, I'll end to talking about our a fight for police reform in the Maryland General Assembly over the past several years. When the uprising happened, so the uprising happened in April 2015, uh, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle were actually working during our General Assembly, which starts in January 2015, with amendments to the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. It's something that was codified in 1974 against police officers of rights above and beyond their constitutional rights. So, example, things like officers at the time um, had 10 days before they were required to make a statement on the record if they're alleged to have engaged in excessive force. Um, so this, they had all this time to, to come up with a story. Also, police officers, the administrative trial boards that determine discipline for police officers were made up exclusively of police officers, right? So we talked about police policing themselves, right? So we wanted to amend the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights in several ways. One of those ways is to um, require civilians, not police officers, to be on those police trial boards. That bill, um, which was sponsored by then Delegate Joe Carter, um, we couldn't even get it out of the committee, right? So the committee chairs, many of you familiar with the legislative process, states and committee wasn't moved. Our, our General Assembly ended second week of April. Later that week, Freddie Gray is taken into custody, and then later on he dies. Uprising happens. The, the presiding officers of our General Assembly um, can be a task force to basically do something legislatively about police reform for the following General Assembly. 
And and it was and so a part of why LBS actually came to prominence is because during that time, the very things that would have addressed the lack of information that was available about what happened to Freddie Gray, the lack of oversight over the procedures that, that allowed him to die the way he did, were the very things that would have been addressed by the amendments that we put forward by the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. And unfortunately, when we came back to the General Assembly in 2016, they, there were a whole bunch of different things put in the bill. Training, you know, implicit bias training, body cameras. The thing that was omitted from the bill was nine, nine police officers on trial boards. Things like allowing for external investigations of a police investigation of police misconduct. Um, and so we had to fight that session to essentially have that amended on to the major leadership bill that would move through the General Assembly. And we weren't able to require civilians on trial boards. We were able to strike the prohibition of non police officers on trial boards. So really, if we look at the solutions to the problem of police violence, it's a question of power. Power is really the only equalizer when it comes to dealing with issues of oppression. That we're not, in a, in a, we're not interested in looking for the benevolence of white folks as a methodology for our liberation, as a way to address the oppression we face. We're looking for the legislative mechanisms of power so that we can protect ourselves from police officers that are not accountable. And so no matter what solution that people put forward, what is paramount, and it has been mentioned earlier, what is paramount is civilian oversight of every aspect of law enforcement. The Fraternal Order of Police, which is the institution that has fought back against many of the things that we've done in the General Assembly, um, in many cases has, all, has always fought back against transparency. And so it's really important that in any work that you participate in, that community oversight of law enforcement is the essential piece. Without that, any other approach to addressing police reform will fall short. Thank you. to let everybody know in advance that this is likely going to run over just a few minutes because I want to give everyone the opportunity to be able to say what they've, they've prepared to say. So our last speaker is Jamila Johnson and she's a senior supervising attorney for the criminal justice reform at Southern Poverty Law Center working in Louisiana. Her team at SPLC works on law enforcement issues and has released two reports on racial profiling and law enforcement data collection. She and her team have also provided guidance on best practices for law enforcement agencies when drafting policies prohibiting racial profiling. Jamila has spent time working with others across the country on how narratives about policing and race can be used to change behaviors and understanding. Prior to joining SPLC, Jamila Johnson served on the board of the ACLU of Washington, where she also provided pro bono services as a cooperating attorney on cases involving police surveillance and monitoring. Jamila spent a decade at Pacific Northwest Law Firm uh, before transitioning into full-time public interest work. She received her law degree from the University of Washington. Let's welcome Jamila. Good afternoon. I want to tell you a little bit about where I live. I presently live in New Orleans in Louisiana. For a very long time, New Orleans and Louisiana have held um, a record that you don't want. They have been the number one incarcerator of their population. Recently, our, um, Oklahoma stepped ahead. So anyone from Oklahoma, raise your hand. Thank you for taking us and moving us to number two. <laughs> It's not a great place to be even in number two because now Oklahoma and Louisiana are so far from everyone else in, in the country. And just for this context, I want to talk a little bit about what that means. In New Orleans, that means in the last decade, but um, each year over the last decade, 96 to 99% of all juvenile arrests were of uh, people of color, children of color. Um, it means that one out of every seven black men in New Orleans is presently um, under some form of supervision or incarcerated. Um, it means that um, uh, until recently, I don't know how many of you know about non-unanimous juries. Uh, it means that in the state of Louisiana, before January 1st of 2019, you could be convicted 
when two people on your jury said you were innocent, right? Um, the number of people who we convict is incredible. Um, and at SPLC, what I do with a team of 13 is that we were um, figuring out how to stop what seems like a never-ending um, uh, system of mass incarceration, which is embedded into everything that happens within the state. Um, and you can't talk about the percentage of the population that's incarcerated unless you talk about who's coming into those systems and unless you start talking about police. So um, our team works on not only back-end reforms through legislation, but we also litigate impact cases about the public defense system and we look at issues of policing. Um, and so I'm going to talk just briefly because I know we have limited time and I have timer in my world. Uh, I'm going to just talk a little briefly about um, racial profiling policies. Um, and I do this because uh, think back to the 1990s, where anyone that you talked to could tell you something about racial profiling. It seemed as if everyone was in this awakening of, we've got an issue, it's racial profiling, we've got to do something about it. Fast forward slightly to 2001, the Louisiana State Legislature taking the call of the communities says, okay, we need to know more about racial profiling. We need to know more about what happens in those traffic stops. When someone gets pulled over, what are the situations? So the Louisiana State Legislature, um, uh, a legislator starts with a bill. And the bill says, we're gonna look at traffic stops. We wanna know what happened at the traffic stop, what was the citation, was there an arrest, what the race of the person was, what their age was. A very basic data. Right, like such a, such a very small data point. Uh, and that seems better than nothing, so it starts moving through the legislature. It gets right before passage, and someone says, well, you know, how about this? They put on an amendment, and they say, if you have a racial profiling policy, you don't have to submit your data. So many reasons why I think the results that we have today could have been predicted then. Um, but so when I came to this work, um, I came to this work with an understanding that there's a law out there that says police departments should be collecting this data. There's a law out there that says that the state should provide it. There's this real weird exception about racial profiling policies. We're like, let's, let's look at the data. Let's see what's happening here. Um, so we talked to 331 law enforcement agencies. Of the 331 law enforcement agencies, we found 109 of them did not have racial profiling policies. That's extreme. Um, of those 109, not a single one had done data collection and the state had never provided a report. So that's my own problem. That's the problem over here. But for the 210 who did have racial profiling policies, we got to see what those looked like. And um, when we're talking about solutions and talking about like where we are in the world, um, I just was shocked to see that most racial profiling policies for law enforcement um, agencies did not actually um, explain what the constitutional standards were. They didn't help people understand what racial profiling was in any way, shape, or form. Um, in some instances, they were nothing more than HR policies. Uh, like literally the HR policy. So what we'll give those folks, I counted them as racial profiling policies because they said they were racial profiling policies. But like, the fundamental thing that I think was fascinating to me was that through all of these like very basic reforms, basic reforms, the first thing you do when you talk to a community about what's happening in that community, when communities of color or others say we want better behavior in law enforcement, we talk about policies, right? Like not about the enforcement of the policies, just drafting the darn policy. And in this state, we had 109 um, jurisdictions without even that first step. And then you get to the second part, and you say, okay, well, what is racial profiling, right? What are the, what what is like what is prohibited behavior, right? Is it okay if I um, don't? If I see someone walking down the street and I see them and I go, well, this person is clearly criminal. They're out of the space that they should be in because of the way that they look. Is that racial profiling? Okay. 
Well, is it racial profiling when you are an officer who's uh, making traffic tickets and you're only stopping black drivers? Is that racial profiling? What we saw over and over and over again is the full scope of the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment wasn't in the policies. And so for um, anyone out here, I don't know if anyone represents law enforcement in this, in this room, please look at your policies. Um, but I, I think we skipped some steps in holding our law enforcement accountable. We, we skip some steps when we start talking about over policing and under protection. Like we haven't done enough to just make sure that like the basic structure of the policies that officers are working with tells them what is legal and what is not legal. Um, and, and that was extremely shocking to me for a number of reasons. Um, it's also shocking to me that um, New Orleans is one of those cities that has started moving into the policing of the future. Um, what that means is that when I walk down the street, there are 440 cameras that have real-time surveillance on me. Um, those cameras run predictive policing models. They can um, follow a person with an orange hat who was standing at um, the corner of Canal and St. Charles, and they can follow every person who had an orange hat that day everywhere they go throughout their days. Um, we have, at the same time as we are not um, responsibly collecting data of small things like pedestrian stops and traffic data, we are um, also in a spot where we are um, entering into really dangerous territory with predictive policing and with, with surveillance and with this policing of the future. Um, we had a contractor in New Orleans who um, uh, had a contract with the city to provide information. Um, and what they would do is they would take the same big data that we know is being collected about us from corporations and they would say, this is the likelihood that this person is going to be involved in crime. And they would give people additional information about someone when they were pulling them over, when they were um, using traffic stop. And like this level of information that police departments are beginning to have about people in their associations and who their cousin is, like, the, as that increases, the public on this end, we're not getting more information about what police officers are doing. We're not getting more information about what is, what's happening, at least not at the same level as the information that police departments are having about the general public. And so in a, in a moving forward space, at least what our group is, is trying to work with, in, um, you know, in a city and a state that has been just devastated by mass incarceration and has incredible disparities in its policing, how do you try to catch up with jurisdictions that have information about policing and good policies and then on the other hand, how do you try to slow down this movement of modernization, this movement of, of surveillance and of um, use of military technologies in our communities in a way that allows us to have even just a second of trying to fix some of the disparities. Um, that's it. Thank you to all of our panelists. We do have time, a little time for questions. Does anyone in the audience have a question? If not, I'm just going to ask a general question. And did I miss something? No, not that. Okay. Okay. Um, you all touched. There is a question. Go ahead. I do have a question. Okay. Um, are this is great to talk all the panelists, but Devon especially, because I think her demand is. Would you speak about this? Please, Okay. All the panelists, I guess, or whoever wants to answer, but Devon especially, because I heard you answer this question, I believe on MSNBC in April 2015. It's about um, about policing, and I think the question that you answered, or the, the question that you got was, how can a police force like Baltimore, where 
um, is 40% or 45% of the food source is African <coughs> minority. How can they, how can a almost majority, you know, black police force or minority police force um, have uh, a bias against uh, a city that it looks like? So, because folks have talked about how on the panel, how um, um, there's a lack of empathy when a police officer doesn't look like you, but clearly that exists also when a police officer looks like you. So, that's yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, and so I think that's a part of um, you know what I was getting at when I was you know that the Amos Wilson quote because I think you know Bobby Rush, Congressman Bobby Rush, actually during the 2016 election cycle actually apologized for his role in the passage of policies that exacerbated mass incarceration. So in the 80s and 90s, what you saw, and Michelle Alexander talks a little bit about this in her book, um, that particularly the black middle class that had access to you know, the political class in the society, um, you know, the fights that they were engaged in had more to do with things like affirmative action, um, things that really impacted the black middle class um, at the expense of the black former working class. And so I think um, you know, when you talk about the internalization of racism or white supremacy, Right, the images that we see, the narratives that we hear constantly, our own community internalizes those images and then exercises the power of enforcing the impact of those narratives on folks in our communities. And so I think it's actually a mistake to frame the issue as one of like white people being mean or not being empathetic to black folks. It's a question of America's general uh, black of regard for the humanity of people of African descent. Um, and until we deal with that, then in terms of the policies that produce the outcome, those things were made attack. We may be able to address individual cases, but in terms of dealing with the system, that will remain intact if we don't understand the power of the internalization of white supremacy by non-white people. Okay. I, can I do the answer? Sure, well? absolutely. Um, I met an officer not too long ago, and he explained to me that he had been in a department which used quotas. And the quota said that you were to have X number of this type of stop mm -hmm. each day, right? Um, there are a number of problems with that. There are a number of reasons why they probably should have been sued for that. But besides that, like, that's not an uncommon thing to hear when I talk to officers. And so what, when I talk to these officers, what they tell me is, you know, it's not that I hate black people. It's that, like, the odds are, because our system's been going like this for so long, that if I pull over someone who is brown, I might have, like, a felon in possession, or I might have something else associated with it, which makes it so that I do better at work, right? Um, and, like, that is messed up for a number of different reasons, but it's also indicative of, like, our structures, our policies, our practices, how we build <coughs> and incentivize policing, it gives the wrong motivations for almost all interactions, and those wrong motivations result in a continuation of, of the same structure, the same system. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. So, I think part of this is also we have to look at police training. Um, a very good friend of mine who grew up in a housing project in New York in a completely minority community joined the police force. And by the end of his training, he and I were having fights because based on his training, he was told that his job was to get home at night. And I said to him, what does that even mean? Now, I don't ever expect my friend to shoot a person of color because he's scared of them simply because of their race. Why? Because that's where he grew up, he was comfortable, he knows how to speak to people, he knows how to de-escalate situations because he's been doing it his whole life. But the idea that other people, without his background, without his upbringing in that place, were being told that your job is to get home at night, then of course everyone on this panel looks like a threat. If what you're seeing and what you're hearing on TV is that we are 80% of the people responsible for most of the crime, when you learn that your job is just to do that, and that's the extent of it, not to you know, whatever the slogan is for your local police department, for all the courtesy, professionalism, and respect. But that, in and of itself, even as a person of color who then joins the police force, sometimes what leads to this idea that if Baltimore has a police department that's 45% African-American, 
how could there be any bias? That's your bias. I will, I will add, having worked in Baltimore prior to being attorney in Howard County, um, that it's exactly what Jose said. Policing out of fear. Fear has no color associated with it. It's simply, I'm not going to make it out of this room without without in, encountering some resistance that might end my that might end my existence. And if you're policing out of fear, right, which is more likely when you're dealing with a community that you don't associate with, that you don't see or function of yourself in, is likely to lead to a great propensity for negative outcomes versus policing from a place where you are comfortable in your own skin. I see you and I don't see you as a threat automatically. And I can relate to you as a human being and therefore exercise my discretion in a way that allows you to survive and me to survive. There are times and circumstances where officers are going to have to use legal force. But those circumstances, it has to be a limited, a limited circumstance based upon the facts of the incident, not based upon the pure fear of the unknown and the idea that I'm, it's, it's almost like I'm in an occupying territory, I'm an occupying force in this space. And that's where the whole I gotta get home at night concept comes from. And so when you're, I don't wanna conflate the two things. Diversity in an office, that's a prosecuting office or police force, is essential to better outcomes. But policing out of fear, regardless of the race of the individuals involved, will always lead to a greater propensity for negative outcomes. Yeah, you know, since everyone, I'm, Everyone's right, I agree with everything. That, that's why the discussion of militarization is so important too, because when you equip people as if they're going to war, it feeds that mentality of, uh, I'm going to war, I'm an occupying force. And, and military and police are night and day, but they, they, they've gotten a lot closer, right? And so there's a reason in, in Europe and other places that police don't have guns. But what do you give to the people that you go out to protect and to serve and be courteous? If you're saying to them, get home, uh, this is, you know, your job is to put on your flag jacket and just everything, even about your appearance, to get a, a big military style truck, that is, that all combines with this fact of internalization that you started with. Um, it, you know, it's, it's the doll test and, and board, Brown v. Board that they did recently again. And they said that the, uh, the most black children said the black doll was the not smart at all, right? And that's that's a part of it too. But I think that's why we have to be more approaching the policies of how we prepare our police and what we equip them with. From everything from the laws that we give them, that there's too many on the books uh, to enforce, to the uh, equipment and everything in between, we have to be thinking about. Yeah, very good point. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Louisiana, and I'm also a former prosecutor, and now. County, you know, parish council. I'm wondering, as Ms. Johnson probably knows, our justice system is kind of financed by the amount of arrest, bonds, and fines you take in. So, I'm wondering how that plays into over policing. And if somebody is running a system that has an alternative method, of financing, uh, what is it, how successful is it, um, how do you move from a system like you have to one that's financing an alternative? So, I'm running an office, and so um, we don't operate that way. There's, there, that would create to me a direct conflict. We don't have any quotas either, right? That, that, that is not the way in which we operate, because if there was a financial incentive towards producing a particular result, in this case, incarcerating people, right, that would create and lead to greater incarcerations. Our promotions, our raises aren't tied to the number of cases you try. We're looking at, we're, we're looking at a, for me, it's about outcomes, and our argument is outcomes related to, did you assess the case properly? Did you spot the issues? Were you prepared for court? And whatever the outcome, whether that's, or on an alternative, to just say, look, this case can't be prosecuted because it shouldn't be for legal reasons or otherwise. And you give, your, you give the staff the ability to exercise their judgment, and you evaluate them on the basis of their judgment. But there's no fiscal incentive. As far as how we're paid, we receive um, a payment from, we receive our budget from the county that is based upon the, the amount of prosecutors we have and the amount of crime we have in the jurisdiction, but it's not 
related to cases processed individually, if you file that, there's no incentive to incarcerate more or to try more or anything like that. Because that would create a terrible problem of interest in my opinion.
you're lazy. I saw a PowerPoint of one of our districts that, that, that said that had a fat cop with the donuts, and this was the cop that has the least stops, and he was doing bad. And here's the, the skinny cop who's doing all the arrests. So we, we still are incentivized. Even in progressive kind of doesn't have this kind of direct financial motivation, we are still incentivizing increased stops, increased engagement with the community. So I think you st that's still a problem uh, law enforcement with law Okay, we're going to end here. This has been a wonderful panel. We have, for those of you who are not familiar with how the ADA works, we take esteemed um, panelists such as this and the ideas and the solutions that you all are bringing forward to help us craft our policy. And then that goes forward to our House of Delegates in hopes that it becomes ADA policy. And many courts throughout the country pull and cite to our policies and their opinions. Many members of um, state and local government draft bills, you know, that are consistent with our, our resolution. So this is really a difference-making panel. We're not just sitting here talking about problems. We are about solutions. And we heard a lot today about, you know, discontinuing the incentive for quotas and things like that, um, alternative methods of financing, the civilian review boards, which I, I Sorry, we didn't get more, you know, a chance to get into that more, but I know that that is something that citizens of Baltimore City have really been fighting for because I know individuals who, who have been doing that. So there are solutions to these issues. We just have to fight to make them a reality. So I want to thank all of our guests, and I want to encourage you all to stay for the next panel, which is on mass incarceration. Congressman Bobby Scott, who's in the back. Um, he's going to be on the panel along with a lot of other distinguished guests. For those of you who are getting CLE credit, please do not forget to sign the form outside so that you can get your credit. So, thank you all.